invite you to be seated in the presence of the Lord because I believe he does have a word for us as we've been talking through the book of Acts. Last month I made the statement that we do not exist for ourselves, but we exist for God. Amen? We exist for him and in our existence for him that we exist for people. And so the, the sentence was, we don't exist for ourselves, but we exist for people. We then talked about how we best serve people as Christians by letting them know that God loves them and wants to be in relationship with them. He wants to be in a true fellowship with them. But the problem is sin. Sin is in the way. And sin cannot be removed by their good works. Sin cannot be removed because they got a tradition of everyone in the family line is a Christian. Sin cannot be removed because of legalism. If I have my skirt at a certain length or if I don't wear makeup, sin cannot be removed because I give a certain amount of money. I'm so uh, altruistic. Sin cannot be removed because I'm a nice person. Sin is not removed because I'm just kind. No, sin can only be removed with the payment of death. I need you to hear me. Sin can only be removed with the payment of death. <laughs> Help us, amen. And so Jesus saved us by paying our sin debt with his own life. That's why he is the good news. The good news and our response then is to believe and thereafter confess him as our savior. That he is the one who absolves us from the penalty of sin and restores our relationship with God. Amen. I'm restored in my relationship with God. Come on, lift your hands. Say, I'm restored in my relationship with God. I'm now connected with the Father. I'm now one in Christ in the Father. The Father said, or Jesus said, I am in you and you are in me and I am in the Father. And so, yes, we can rejoice and we can give thanks because the blessing is now on our, on our lives. So we can flourish. We can expect the open door and we can expect all of the things that the riches that he's promised where he said, I'll bless the work of your hands. He said that I'll cause your, oh, the, the, I'll be your rear guard. I'll be the glory and lifter of your head. So we can expect all of those things, but... <laughs> But, and yes, we are blessed with all of the things that are related to a flourishing life, but that is not all life is for. That is not all life is for. What are you going to do for me, God? When are you going to do this for me, God? That is not all life is for. When we came out of the hole of death, we came out running and jumping, praising God. But there are so many people still left in the hole. So if we run off acting like this is glorious day, but we know folk are in the hole, that's a problem. We have to, in good conscience, go back and get people out of the hole too. As believers, we are commissioned to tell others the good news. That Jesus paid our sin debt with death. But he rose from the dead and he is alive. He is alive. You don't have to stay in the hole. And he's still active in the lives of those who believe. Just as he was active when Jesus walked the earth. Just as he was active through Peter and John as we have read in the book of Acts chapter 3 and 4. He is still active and working through believers but you won't know that until you respond to the commission and go
You will never know if you're not willing to go back to the hole and reach your hand in to pull someone out. Remember, Jesus worked through G Peter and a lame man was healed. But the healing wasn't the end of the story. The story didn't end there. Peter shared with onlookers the good news. He preached the gospel of the kingdom of God to a captive audience because they saw the power of God and then they heard the good news of Jesus Christ. It was a glorious time because people heard and put their trust in Jesus. But as much as some heard and put their trust in Jesus, others were not as receptive to the news of Jesus. So we also talked about the adversity that they faced because they preached the good news of Jesus. Why did they have adversity? Because they preached the good news of Jesus. Why did they have problems? Because they told people about Jesus. Why were they picked on and, can and hit and beat? Because they went back to the hole to say, you don't have to be in that hole and any longer there was persecution there was adversity and so we talked about this adversity that they faced when they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ but Peter and John would not just say I don't want to do this anymore I'm scared they didn't shrink back but they prayed for more boldness you all remember they prayed for more what boldness that even if you hit me I will not stop even if it's uncomfortable I will not hide the truth of this gospel the lesson was designed to inspire us to do and not just be the lesson was designed to what inspire each one of us to do and not just be to determine who is around us that's not saved and does not know, but should at least hear. It's not our job to determine if they'll receive. It's our job just to make sure that they hear. It was presented so that we would each accept our responsibility as ambassadors for Christ. Because not only will we each be accountable for the folk that are in the whole. We will be accountable for the people in the whole, but even more, we will in effect earn wages and gather fruit for eternal life according to John 4.36. How many of you want some fruit? Everybody says, I can't wait to get to heaven, but wait, you want to have some fruit when you get there. <laughs> You don't want them all, everybody else going in, in front of you. Wait about, what about me, God? <laughs> what about, I want some fruit. That comes when we look at the people in the hole and we determine that we will reach back and grab them out of the hole too. And so we must be willing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ regardless of antagonists, regardless of adversity, regardless of hostility. We must act. We must share Jesus with people. Yeah, now we're not ready to run around and jump up and down. Where's the blessing? Where's the blessing? The blessing, the blessing. Hmm. Well, tonight we want to focus on four people to identify where our hearts are when giving meaning to the fear of God. Where our hearts are when giving meaning to the fear of God. Do we fear God rightly? Are we honoring him with our lives? Is it just about coming to church? Is it just about me singing on the platform? What does it mean for me to truly fear God in this life? Not just in private devotion, but in my public one as well. Not just publicly, but in my private time as well. You see, it's so easy, so very easy to proclaim Jesus and live for Jesus when everyone around you shares your convictions. Amen? 
It's real easy to say hallelujah then. But who we are should translate in all arenas, even when there is hostility or outright rejection. As believers, we should not be easily averted or intimidated because we fear God. We should not be easily silenced simply because we're uncomfortable. Because our resolve is based upon our allegiance or our fear of God. We fear God and no man. Come on, say, I fear God and no man. Come on, say it again. I fear God and no man. Peter and John understood that and they rejoiced when beaten. The scripture says they rejoiced in being beaten because they were sharing in the suffering with Christ. Thus, we must ask ourselves if we fear God enough to hold fast to the gospel regardless. Because if we do, if we persevere to the end, we are the ones who will be saved. This is how Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 24. It's hard, but it's right. Somebody say it's hard, but it's right. I need to hear it. I need to be prepared. Don't you want to be prepared? You don't want somebody to tell you something. I didn't hear that. I didn't know that, God. <laughs> no, we want to be prepared. Amen? Let's look at Matthew 24. We're looking at verse 9. It says there, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. This is Jesus talking. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures, he who what? Endures. He who what? Endures. He who what? So I could also not endure. I could faint. I could stop. I could stumble. It is a possibility. And we see in scripture where folk did. So he says in verse 13, he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. And so Jesus says in advance, I want you to tell the world who I am. But know in advance that there will be persecution. See, I really sense this in my spirit that the church has to be prepared. I'm not just talking about it so we can feel beat up. That's not the goal. But there is a reality that if it, I mean, it's happening all over the world, y'all. The church is being persecuted. Folk are being killed for the gospel. And sadly, too many of us in America feeling nice and cushy and safe, we're not... I, it's imperative that we know what we believe and why. It is imperative for us to have a, a decision. We make a decision now who we will be and not wait until tribulation comes, persecution comes, and then go, oh, what's going on? Where's the blessing? Where's the blessing? We have to be prepared. Jesus says in advance, I want you to tell the world who I am. But know in advance that there will be persecution. There will be backlash. You may suffer for my sake. But if you maintain who you are, you will be with me forever. In other words, if you fear God enough to be a Christian, then be a Christian. Make a decision on who you will serve, where your allegiance is, and then stick to it regardless. Oh, I want to make you think tonight. I want you to lay on your bed or your pillow tonight and say, Lord, where am I exactly? In the same way that I cannot work for the U.S. government and the Russian government and claim an allegiance, <laughs> or I cannot work for Nike and Adidas because there will be a conflict of interest, Jesus says the same. You cannot serve or fear or honor God and mammon. You cannot be committed to or honor to God and then honor or give your life to Belial. You cannot serve two masters. So when there is pressure in life who you fear will always be exposed by how you respond and so our message is entitled I fear God come on say it with me I fear 
fear God. And we go back to the book of Acts chapters 5 through 7 where we begin with a look at number 1 Ananias and Sapphira. We're looking at Acts 5 1 through 4. It says, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession and he came back part and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but who? God. To God. But to who? God. To understand this couple, we have to remember how the church is flourishing at this time. Peter and John are effective witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So people are believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is growing exponentially and the believers have all things in common. The scripture says that they're eating together, that they're praying together. Even more, chapter 4 verse 34 says, nor was there anyone who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had a need. And so this couple is surrounded by people who fear God. They're standing amongst, fellowshipping amongst people who just sold their house and gave the proceeds, gave the, the equity to people in need. So they're committed to the gospel. <laughs> they, they're people who seem like they're committed to the gospel, but they're amidst others who are not just committed, but we see them have a commitment that speaks to an understanding of a greater and true value of what is important in this life. And so while Ananias and Sapphira likely came to believe on Jesus just like these others, their actions demonstrated a commitment to mammon instead. They did not honor God. They did not fear him. Now, maybe they were dealing with jealousy. Maybe they stumbled in comparing themselves to others. You just sold your, and you just get, oh, wow. And you just sold your, and you just, oh, man. Okay, we, we need to do something. Maybe they felt the pressure. Maybe they were filled with pride trying to prove something that just wasn't necessary. But the net net, the bottom line is the interpretation of their actions was deduced as lying to to the Holy Spirit. And so Peter breaks it down for Ananias saying, you did not need to lie. Like it wasn't even necessary. It was your money. No one made you do that. No one said you had to give. In other words, giving is a matter of the heart. In the same way that God gave his son because of love, our response to God, our honor or our fear of him should be from the heart. And what's in our heart is seen by what we do and what we give and not because of an obligation or out of compulsion. Our giving to God, whether it's our time, whether it's a gift or a talent for the church or it's our treasure, our tithe and our offering. It is because of our desire to please him, to honor him, to give thanks to him, to worship him, to adore him. That's what it means to fear God. I hope I'm getting the message across of what does it mean for me to fear him? And so Ananias and Sapphira, they may have had good intentions, but they really didn't fear God. They really didn't have their focus on him. They were focused on their money. They were focused on their reputation. They were focused on the reception of others, the perception of others. But before we judge them too harsh, harshly, we each must consider the motives of our own heart. The underlying reasons that we determine to pray or not pray, to offer our strengths or our gifts to the church or not. Do I want to do this to be seen or do I want to do this because I want to please God? I want to honor him. I want to bless him. 
The reason that I pay my tithe and give my offerings or not, we have to be honest with ourselves because when there is a fear of God, nothing, it takes precedence above him. Nothing is more important than him. No one informs our response in this life but him. Ananias and Sapphira missed it and they paid with their life. But then we look at a man named Peter. Peter and John. We'll look at both men. They're in Acts chapter 5. We're looking at verse 29, verse 2, verse 32. But Peter and the other apostles, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered, by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Acts chapter 5 continues outlining how many signs and wonders were done among the people. That's in verse 12. And how the people increasingly began to believe. How people would bring their sick. <laughs> they brought them into the street on couches and on beds. And the very shadow of Peter would cross, uh, come across them and they would be healed. The very shadow of Peter would bring healing to these people. Peter was getting folk out of the hole. He was working on getting people out of the hole through his fear of God. And verse 16 says that they were all healed. Not certain people. No, they were all healed. They were healed because Jesus was and is alive. And so he was still active, acting through those that fear God. And we see the fear of God in Peter's life as he was committed, regardless of the suffering he endured. He honored God as a bold witness, not shrinking back, but giving himself fully to whatever God wanted him to do. He was not just being, he was doing doing even when there was opposition chapter 5 verse 29 records him saying we ought to obey God rather than men we ought to obey God rather than men what about my job we ought to obey God rather than what if they don't like me anymore we ought to obey God rather, what if they shun me and I'm a part of the club and now I won't have, we ought to obey God rather than men. You see, Peter and John ended up on trial again. This is the history. They ended up on trial again for getting people out of the hole and telling them about Jesus. They were imprisoned for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But because they feared God, they weren't intimidated by the threats. They weren't intimidated by the pain or the injustice. And God himself brought them out of prison. That's the blessing. That's that blessing that we want to talk about. When are you going to break the yoke? When are you going to set me free? What does our fear of God look like? He, God spoke to them himself saying, okay, come out of the prison. Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. I need you to hear me tonight. I believe God is saying the same to each of us. If he brought you out of the struggle, if he brought you out of the pit, if he brought you out of darkness, if he brought you out of the every weight or the shame, if he brought you out, yes, rejoice, celebrate your freedom, but that's not all you were meant to do. <laughs> Go back and preach the words of life. Don't be intimidated by rejection or mockery or threats, but fear God and keep his commandments. And the same Jesus who was active when Jesus walked the earth and active through Peter and John will be active through your life too. Oh, hear me, too. 
where you lay your hands on the sick and the sick recover. You say you got a headache? Well, let me pray for you in the name of Jesus. Father, I fear you. I trust that your word shall come to pass. This is not a one-man show. This is the church that is supposed to be active in the land. The church is supposed to be alive. Who's the church? Everybody raise your hand in your homes and here in this room. We are the church. Active. Christ active in our lives because we fear God and no man. Somebody shout, I fear God. Before we close, we must look at number three, Stephen. Acts chapter six, we're looking at verse eight through 10. And Stephen full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Now, Stephen was not one of those popular disciples but he did fear God. <laughs> he heard the message of Jesus and he believed. He then demonstrated his allegiance to the end. So no, we may not be Peter. We may not be Paul. But if we fear God, we can expect that our allegiance will make the difference in who we are in the kingdom of God. If we read the full account of Stephen, the known apostles were looking for someone to serve, uh, serve food in their daily distribution. And Stephen was one of seven chosen. He may have been overqualified because he's described as full of faith and power, one who did, not, who, one who did great wonders and signs among the people. But because of his devotion to God he's willing to serve he's willing to give himself because he believes he may be overqualified but he's what willing he may be overqualified but he's willing you may be overqualified but you must be willing willing because we fear God and again Jesus is active within whoever fears God enough to get out of their comfort zone and stand up as well as speak up and Stephen feared God the crowd disputed with Stephen verse 10 says that they could not resist the wisdom of God with which he spoke because God is active in Stephen's life even more he wants to be active in each one of our lives too but he cannot not act in our lives if we fear man, if we fear rejection, if we fear repercussions, if we fear everything and everyone but God. God is looking for bold witnesses. He's looking for bold witnesses. Bold witnesses. I'm not bold. Then I pray for more boldness, but God is looking for what? Bold witnesses. People who may be overqualified, but still ready to give themselves. People who have an audience that may not like what's being said, but will listen no less. The gospel is provocative, and Stephen does not back down. He could have been diplomatic. He could have tried to calm the crowd, but instead he presents the history of Israel. He makes his case for Jesus, and then he rebukes them strongly. <laughs> You uncircle. I mean, he rebukes some real good. He has a fear of God. He's not, he's not afraid of living or dying. He has a fear of God. And the people, this people, they don't readily repent like Peter and John's crowd. They don't repent. These people get offended. They get offended and then they start gnashing their teeth at Stephen. Before it was over, they stone him. They literally stoned this man because he gave them the truth. But Stephen responds to their stoning in love, saying, forgive them. He's following Jesus' example. He says, 
forgive them. Then God shows himself strong. He didn't deliver Stephen from death. But verse 55 says, being full of the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand. He, see, if you know your Bible, the Bible says Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father. But at this stoning, uh, Stephen, he's looking in the heavens and he says, I see. I see what? He gazed in heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. See, the fear of God may cause pain in your life, but there is a promise that is far greater that Stephen taps into. It's a reminder to each one of us that this life is temporary. And so we must love God. We must honor him. We must worship him. We must honor him with our whole hearts, everything in us. We must rejoice in him because that's what it means to fear him. But we must also live for him. Living for Jesus is more than being. It's actually doing. It's representing him. It's serving him and honoring him with wholehearted devotion. Acts chapter 5 through 7 is a picture of what it looks like to fear God from the heart. And I challenge us to consider our hearts even now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to ask that you will consider what does it look like for you to fear God in your life? What does it look like for you to love him and care about what he thinks more than you care about what people think? What does it look like for you to share the truth to people who may reject you, but yet you recognize they'll be lost, and so you'll say it again and again and again? What would it look like for you to fear God and let Jesus act, work through your life too? In Jesus' name.